30 minutes. Thank you, Chair, for the opportunity and the members of the committee. I will have uh, the 30 minutes shared between myself and my learned friend, Mr. Mwangi. Very recently, honorable members, I had the opportunity to appear before the Supreme Court together in my, with my learned friend, Dr. Mudomi Diankolu, representing a mutual client on a presidential election petition. And Dr. Mudomi Diankolu described the petition seeking to overturn the election as shock and awe because it was out here based on too much hula balloon. I am sad today to use the same words against Dr. Mudomi because we do find the notice of impeachment to be exactly that, shock and awe. In that we have Chair, you can't use the word against me. There is no case by me before the Senate. The case belongs to the county assembly. I, I stand by this. Shock and precisely. Shock and O A W E. Those were words used by Dr. Muthomi to describe that petition. I'm only using the same words borrowing from my uh, good friend Dr. Muthomi. The reason why I'm saying that this matter is shock and awe is because a very negative and scary picture has been painted against the governor. We all sat here when the governor was being described as the modern day Hitler. And we would have expected that the evidence to be placed before this committee would have confirmed that same picture. Honorable members, you will confirm indeed that there was no evidence to that effect. So that left me wondering, why is the governor on trial? Is it because of our emotions? Is it because of our passion? Is it because of our temperament? Is it because of our mystics? Is it because of our firmness? Is it because of our leadership style? Honorable members, none of this is a ground to impeach a governor. The governor might be emotional, might be passionate, might have a style of leadership that is not understood by many. But even then, and I'm not trying to justify that, is that the ground that was envisaged under Article 181, under Article 33 of the Constitution? Do we have any other ways of dealing with such a situation rather than impeaching a governor. And that's why in our opening remarks, we were quick to state that we should differentiate between a political weapon and an oversight tool. The MCAs have oversight tools to check the governor, to check the executive, to bring it back on track when they stray. The MCAs have not come before you with clean hands. There is one maximum of equity that says, he who comes to equity must come with clean hands. Honorable members, when you sat here, can we agree that the MCAs are not at fault? Are they blameless? Have they come before this committee with clean hands? Have they themselves failed the disagreement in Meru? Have they, do they have their own share of blame to what is happening in Meru? Have they been seen fixing the governor, disrespecting her, putting her in a very awkward situation? Can we then allow these same MCAs to benefit from their own misconduct and have an entire election overturned over Instances where they have been party to. A case in point I will draw the attention of the committee to is when the MCAs intentionally block the governor from accessing the chamber in a day when they have themselves gazetted and invited the governor. The governor is ushered in by the speaker. The speaker allows 
the MCAs to conduct themselves in an unparliamentary manner, the Speaker is not seen in any way trying to control the House, then they come before the Senate and they want you to find that it was the Governor who forcefully entered that County Assembly. It would, unfair, it would be unfair for us to sit here and assume that the County Assembly of Meru comes before you with clean hands. Let's talk about impartiality, honorable members of this committee. Article 50 and 49 of our Constitution is supreme in as far as the right to fair hearing is concerned. The County Assembly of Meru, once it was seized of this motion, was supposed to be a quasi-judicial body that is supposed to uphold impartiality, that is supposed to uphold the right to fair hearing. Can we see really the conduct of that county assembly was conduct enough to suggest that they were in any way impartial? If, for example, today, honorable members, you went to court, and the first thing the judge does is dance how they are going to slaughter you. Do you expect any fair hearing before that committee? We watched the MCAs dawned in red very early in the morning before they even had the move of the motion. They sang inside the county assembly, just stamping how they are going to teach the governor a lesson. Can we say that is an impartial committee that the governor ought to have appeared before and expect justice and expect fairness? I beg to differ. So this confirms indeed that the County Assembly of Meru and the MCAs had a predetermined outcome of this motion and they did not bother to even interrogate the issues before them. So what then is the threshold that ought to be upheld or met by any person seeking to impeach the governor? Because impeaching a governor is the last resort. Once the governor before you today is impeached, honorable members, it is not just about her removal from office. Going by the recent Supreme Court decision in the Mike Sonko case, the governor cannot even be in charge of any cattle committee because she will have been condemned forever. She lacks leadership skills. Are we telling this governor here today, that based on the evidence bef brought before this committee, that this governor, forever and ever, at her age, and with only two months of being in office, that she has done so serious mistakes that she can never ever run for any leadership position? Because once you condemn her and uphold the impeachment, it will be the end of this governor to ever present herself for any of public office in this country. So the framers of the Constitution put a threshold under Article 181, and they used very strong and specific adjectives, gross violations, gross misconduct. So it is not just any violation that qualifies for impeachment. It must be gross. It is not any misconduct that can justify an impeachment, it must be gross. So the question that the committee ought to ask itself when you retire to prepare your report is that has there been any gross misconduct, any gross violation? Gross is the highest standard of misconduct or violation, it must be very clear. You cannot be looking for this kind of misconduct. It must be very glaring and very conspicuous. I want to submit that there has been no demonstration of gross violation, gross misconduct. So even if the committee was to be tempted to find that there is misconduct or violation, does that become gross? Does the evidence before this committee support the grossness of that misconduct or violation? In criminal liability, lawyers 
speak about two ingredients that confirm criminal liability. One is what is called mens rea. Mens rea is a state of mind that the person accused of criminal liability must have the state of mind, must have intended to commit a particular crime. But then, criminal liability alone is not proved by a state of mind. The person who conceives the commission of a crime must go ahead and commit the crime. That is what is called actus reus. So those two combined then form an offense. So with only the state of mind, without the action itself, you cannot be held criminally liable. Most of the accusations against the governor are in respect of utterances that have not even been actioned. So even if the committee was to find that the governor has, or rather is guilty of these utterances, were any of those utterances ever actioned to justify criminal liability? I have not seen any action that has been taken by the governor that can justify that liability. Honorable members, if there were any appointments to any office, there would be an instrument of appointment. If there was any misappropriation of funds, there would be evidence of money lost. If there was any intention to benefit the first gentleman, there would be evidence to that effect. Can we then find the governor guilty because of mens rea minus actus reus? The intention without the action. There is no action to accompany that uh, intention, if indeed there was any intention in the first place. The Court of Appeal in the Martin Nyaga Wambora case, which was, I believe, the ever first impeachment uh, motion to go through all the stages, the Supreme Court and the Court of Appeal had an opportunity to interrogate. Counsel, you have 10 minutes. Thank you, uh, Honorable Chair. So the question that the Court of Appeal sought to give guidance on is what amounts to gross violation as envisaged under Article 181. And they said that the allegations must be serious, substance, substantial, and weighty. So that not, so that not only no, so that not any allegation would qualify under Article 181. There must be a nexus between what the governor is alleged to have done and a particular violation of the Constitution or any written law. So then you would expect that of any of the 62 allegations, the county assembly would pin and compare this action is in violation of this particular law. Have we seen that? We have not seen that. For example, you have been told that the governor has appointed the first gentleman to a public office. One, we must see the public office to which this first gentleman has been appointed to. That would be a violation. So we have not seen that nexus. Honorable members, because of time, allow me to uh, look at the issue of public participation. And this is an issue that I really want the committee and beseech you to really spend time on, scrutinizing all the memoranda that have been uh, presented before you. If you carefully go through all those memoranda, you will inevitably find that they were done by one person or a group of persons, so that to the extent that you have similar spelling mistake and typographical errors in almost all those uh, memoranda. If then there is that attempt, you can see the desperation to justify that the people of Meru really wanted the governor to be out of office. Burden of proof. It was incumbent upon the county assembly of Meru to prove their case to support gross misconduct, to support gross violation. It was not upon the governor to prove our innocence. And that's why your own rules provide for a situation even where the governor is given a right not even to appear before the committee. You would not then just pass a resolution to uphold without interrogating whether the county assembly has met or discharged the burden of proof. 
So it is not enough for the county assembly to accuse the governor of not having tendered evidence to prove her innocence. It works the other way around. It is for them to prove her guilt because the governor is presumed innocent until proven guilt. I want to yield to my learned friend to address you on one or two issues before uh, sitting down. But then before I do that, you have heard the governor herself plead with this committee that she has tried to make amends, that she had tried to reach out to other leaders, that maybe it was an issue of misunderstanding between her and the other leaders, that the issue at hand is word fund. And the MCS came here and denied that fact. But the evidence we brought confirmed that indeed that is the genesis of this problem. She promises that once there is a legal mechanism of dealing with that issue, then there will be no problem. Honorable members, I beseech you to give the people of Meru a chance to experience their choice. If then there is a mistake done, we should be able to judge her with concrete evidence, not based on emotions and uh, utterances. Thank you very much, Honorable Chair and members. Thank you. Councillor, you have six minutes. Thank you, 